Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to Parkway Christian Church. I am excited to have you all here on this cold, brisk, oh my gosh, what is the temperature? 90 below zero? <laughs> it's cold out there. It's too cold. So uh, glad to have you all here. Uh, if this is your first time watching us on TV, we are Parkway Christian Church located right across from uh, Veterans uh, Highway, and uh, we are glad to be in the house of the Lord. I think we just have one announcement. Our church-wide Bible study starts on Thursday, and it'll be structured very much the same way our, our first one was. We'll be studying uh, God in the Gay Christian by uh, Matthew Vines. It's a really, really good book. Um, I think it's really going to help us uh, enter uh, into deeper, deeper conversations. So it'll be it's structured the exact same way. There'll be homework. There'll be lessons planned, and I think you get the lesson plan. I can't remember. I'll check with somebody who knows more than me, but I'll check. So you should have gotten your essays back from my anti-racism Bible study. Oh my gosh. You guys did such fantastic. I was crying. I was laughing. I was like, oh my gosh, the, the work that you turned in was super fantastic. Um, I made a few phone calls to some professors and to the region. So some of y'all uh, get ready to blow up here. <laughs> we get ready to put some of y'all on camera. Uh, the, the essays were just above, beyond my expectations. And more than half the class turned in essays. More than half the class. And I was um, talking to a friend, uh, she teaches out at Lexington, and she said, so, so what are you doing? I said, well, I'm finishing up of uh, essays from church. She said, essays? You gave your congregation homework? And they did it? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I was like, yeah, they, they have homework. <laughs> and yes, they turned it in, you know, because uh, it is, we are the church of the 21st century, so uh, we will put an emphasis on on uh, grounding our understanding and our faith in sound theological learning. And you guys just blew it out the park. So I'm looking forward to no pressure. We'll still have the three levels, you know, the um, medium, intermediate. What are they? Anybody? Yeah, Slim Pickens. <laughs> Deep dive. And on the go. And on the go. So you can enter in at whatever level that you want. Now, the Slim Pickens is simply your reflection after the meeting. This is what I learned, and so a lot of people just turn right after the meeting. They just email, you know, this is what I learned, this is what I thought. Uh, the 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 deep dive, which more people actually did the deep dive than than what I thought would do it, and those turned out really, really, really well. So I am looking forward to. Um, our reader writer for for the first one was Rev Grant, and the second one is Lori Myers. She's our reader writer from this one. So. Just to kind of know how it was all set up, I picked a member from the church to be a reader writer, gave them two books because they know the church better than I know the church. Said, read these two books, pick which one you think will really help us have the kind of conversation that we need. So the reader writers took two books, read them both, outlined the one that they thought would be better for the congregation, and then gave me a whole page assessment on what they think. Uh, about this and how it would help Parkway. So Rev did the first one, uh, Lori Myers is doing the second one, and then Bob Grant is doing the third one. So this way we're kind of cultivating an understanding of how the church is and, and what the church needs. And so this one is gonna be, I'm really excited about this one. So make sure you, uh, I think we just, we just gave away our last book, didn't we, Aaron? But we can order some more if you wanna be a part of that study. We can order some more. So I think that's that's it. Kimmy has added more masks and has said if you want to take some to your place of employment, she has some for children as well that you can donate. You can take a few and, and take them to your work or, or wherever you might need. I think that's... Oh, birthdays! Somebody had a birthday this week! Matt, do you know anybody had a birthday this week? Yeah. Who? Uh -huh. <laughs> Happy birthday! Uh, Larry Warline had a birthday, had a birthday, and also Steve Myers had a birthday, right? So lots of
of January maybe. So uh, that concludes my chitter chatter, otherwise known as the announcement. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Chris Boyce, and I am privileged to serve as your elder this week. Please bow and pray. In the midst of every storm, God, we lift our voices to call out your name and offer you our praise. We are grateful for your steadfast actions, even as we face today's challenges. Today, we give thanks that we can come to this place of calm and reverence. Help us to leave behind all the strife in the world that surrounds us. Grant your spirit to fill us today as we worship you, that you will be well pleased with us. Amen. I still want to continue to encourage us to to use our newsletter um, and send in those prayer requests. Um, I talk often about going into my prayer closet. I take the newsletter with me into my prayer closet. It doesn't necessarily have to be an actual prayer closet. It's just a time of the day, whether it's in the morning or in the evening or, in, or at night, where you just take time to steal yourself and mention the names, the joys, and the concerns for those uh, listed um, in our list. Of, I don't know, Rita, Waterman called me last night, and they had another death in the family. And um, so she she was here present at the morning service. She said, Pastor, you know, I think I'm going to try, but I might have to leave early if I, if I can't do it. But she was here in, uh, in good spirits and at home resting now. So we want to remember uh, those uh, in our family who are struggling with sickness. Um, I know we have several names mentioned in our newsletter. I also have a little Bible prayer promise book that I've had for like 15 or 20 years. And sometimes as a part of my prayer, I'll just take a promise and I'll mention that promise over that concern or, or whatever. So continue to pray. We do serve a God that is in the miracle working business. We do serve a God that's faithful. And so I want to encourage us as a body to pray, encourage you to pray with your family, for those of you that have have, have loved ones that are out. There's nothing wrong with calling and saying, can I share Can I share a word of prayer with you? Just want you to know that I'm thinking about you and I love you and sharing, sharing your faith uh, with others, that's a part of spiritual formation. So I want to encourage us to do that. So please join me in our uh, pastoral prayer. Can we take a moment and still our prayer ourselves before the throne of a God who loves us? You are the beautiful night sky, and your love towards us shines like the stars. We adore you because you are ever faithful and compassionate towards us. We adore you because you love us, even when we don't love you back. We adore you because your mercy is unconditional. Your grace is limitless. We adore you because on our worst day, you still believe in us. You still love us and call us your own. We confess that hatred and bigotry have clouded our senses. We confess we are a nation in chaos. We confess all the subtle ways that we have allowed viciousness and violence to seep into our words to seep into our thoughts, to seep into our actions. We confess that we have turned a blind eye to our pride. We have justified and minimized our pride till it has become full blown. We confess we are like Herod. We pretend to love the lies while all along we seek to destroy it. We confess that we are in need of a heart change and a mind change. We are thankful that in exchange for condemnation, you offer us grace. We are thankful that in exchange for brute force, you offer us mercy. We are thankful that in exchange for hate, you offer us love. Your word teaches us that you will give us beauty for ashes, tears of joy for our sorrows, 
Thank you for your compassion towards us. We ask you, dear God, to take out the stony heart filled with chaos, hatred, and confusion. Give us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. Transform us from Herod into the wise followers of the light. Help us to journey towards the light. Help us to look at the beautiful dark sky and interpret the stars as your love towards us. Renew our minds so that we can discern good from evil. Renew our minds so that pride cannot overtake our hearts. Help us to seek goodness and mercy over power and force. Now let us pray together as a family the prayer that Christ taught us to pray, saying, Father, Lord, I Our scripture reading this morning is from the Book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So, brothers and sisters, because of God's mercies, I encourage you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. This is your appropriate priestly service. Don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can figure out what God's will is, what is good and pleasing and mature. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Thank you, Craig. So once again, we are talking about Paul. So I won't give you my whole spiel over Paul, because you all probably know that now by heart. Uh, and, and if you're not, when we get done with the Bible study, you'll be like, oh, yes, we know that by heart. So Paul wrote Romans for um, just a little bit of background for, for either three reasons. The first reason was that um, the Judean Christians who had been exiled uh, because of the emperor were coming back. And when they got back to their home church, it was filled with Gentiles. So the new, the Judean Christians was like, who are these people in our church? And the Gentiles was like, well, who are y'all? And so this is, there's this whole thing about, well, whose church is this? Because the Gentiles believe that the Judean Christians uh, weren't really Christians, because you know they really didn't like Jesus that much. 
<laughs> so, and the uh, Judean Christians were like, well, well, you guys are Gentiles, and um, so that's, that Gentile and Christian doesn't even work well together. So there was like this huge kind of influx. So it's speculated that he wrote it to kind of unify the congregation. Basically, there were two separate beliefs. We had the, I think in the, in, we had the purple team, then we had the papoose team. Is papoose a color? Is that a food? No, it's an Indian baby. Okay, well, yeah. <laughs> way off base with that one. <laughs> well, there was the purple team, and then we'll go, there was the green team. And so Paul is like trying to get the two teams to understand that, they, that each one is equally the body of Christ. Each one can equally sort of inhabit and be a congregation together. So you can imagine he is in a tricky position. So imagine with me, he calls the two teams into the congregation, into the church, and he says, okay, I want you to write down what your issues are with the purple team. Then he says to the other team, and I want you to write down what your issues are with the, did I say green? With the green team. So of course each team has a representative and the green team goes up and says, <coughs> Paul, our issues are this. We love our church. We're just concerned about the new people. We don't want things to go bad. So Paul writes on the board, concerned about new people, don't want things to go bad. Then the other team gets up and they say, <clears throat> Paul, our concern is we think you might, they might not understand sort of how we've been doing things here. So Paul goes to the board and writes, confusion over how to do church. Then the other team gets up and they write, well, <clears throat> Paul, you know, we've been here a long time. And we are in fact fine with change. We just don't want, you know, you know Paul. Change is good, but, uh, so Paul writes, change is good, but, uh. Now imagine for me, Paul, since he hears the complaints, he, he documents everything, he sits down, then he says, okay, let's go back over the complaints. And he writes them down and goes back over them. And then he says, I want to offer you a different concept. Paul goes to the board and he writes, but what if God wants you to change your mind? He puts the markers down and he walks out. What if God wants you to change your mind? So when we get to Romans 12, 1 and 2, so brothers and sisters, because of God's mercy, I encourage you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your appropriate priestly service. Don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can figure out what God's will is, what is good, pleasing, and mature. Our text is a call for transformative living. It is a call for spiritual formation. It is a call for a deeper level of discipleship. It is a call, it is God calling us to continue to be followers of the way. True stand transformation starts when we allow God the space and the room to change our minds. There's a story in Luke about the prodigal son. The prodigal son is spending time with, uh, uh, with his, his, his father and the business is going good. The business is booming and Things are going good, and the prodigal son goes to his father and says, Listen, I'm tired of living in your house, tired of living by your rules, tired of you controlling me and telling me what to do. I want my money, I want it now, and I'm getting out of this place. The father calls the accountant and says, Write my son the check, give him his inheritance. So the accountant writes out the inheritance, 
one bazillion dollars. We don't know how much it was, it was a lot. Writes the check out, the young son takes the check, and he heads straight for Las Vegas. <laughs> he cashes the check, he gets a fancy car, he gets a fancy jacket, he goes, he buys a big house, he goes to the club, says drinks for everybody. He's spinning, he's willing, he's dealing, he's partying, he's living it up. He got his father's money, this is up. This, I knew it was going to be better as soon as I got out the house. Five years go by, the accountant calls and says, listen, your dad wants me to tell you, you're spending more money than you're taking in. You tell my dad to mind his business. I know exactly what I'm doing. I got friends, I got money, I got food, I got this big house and this fancy car. You tell him to mind his business. So he goes back and he parties and he's partying and he's buying houses and buying cars and treating his friends. Five years later, the accountant calls back and says, listen, I just got a message from your dad. You need to slow down. Who does he think he is? I'm grown. You tell him to leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. He goes back, same lifestyle. He's living it up. He's spending money. He's doing it. He's doing. He's making deals and stealing money and growing me. Gets a far call from the accountant. Says, "Listen, you have no money. They're coming for the house. They're coming for the car. You have nothing. You have two dollars and a peppermint. It's bad." Time goes on and he finds himself in need of a job. He's homeless now. He has no skill, no money, no references. So he walks up and down and he finds a farm. He goes to a farm and he says, listen, I have no skill, no money, no references. Can I please just work here for food? I will eat what the animals eat. And they give him a job and he is slopping with the pigs. He looks at his state, and the Bible says something interesting. The Bible says as he's slumping with the pigs, he came to his senses. In other words, his mind changed. He came to his senses and he says, now wait a minute, my father owns a business. My father hires people who work for his business. He said, I will arise and I will go back to my father. His mind changed. He hit rock bottom and his mind changed. What does it take for your mind to change? What does it take for you to see things differently? Transformation is about the heart changing so that the mind changes so that you can open yourself up to what God has a purpose for you. God has a plan for you. Transformation is about the journey from the head to the heart. When we allow God to change our minds, when we allow God to change our hearts, when it, we allow God to change our plans, we begin to understand our purpose. He was swapping with the hogs, and he realized God created me for something different. He had a mind change. He had a heart change and it opened himself up to God's purpose. He decided to go back to his father. He did not allow pride to keep him in that place. He did not allow pride to keep him from changing his heart. What does it take for a heart to change? Another story is told in Matthew about the Canaanite woman. You guys have heard this before? Jesus is leaving a place and a woman comes up with a sick child and, 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 he, and she says to Jesus, she said, Jesus, my, my daughter is sick. She's sick. Jesus looks at her and says, shall I give God's bread to a dog? Shall I give God's bread to a dog? This is 
not a flattering picture of Jesus. This is not a good picture of Jesus. Jesus was immersed in a cultural understanding that there were some folks who were in and there were some folks who was out, and Jesus understood that I'm called to the folks who are in, and she's considered out. And the woman looked at Jesus and said, you are correct, but even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. Jesus stood back. His heart began to race. She looked at Jesus and she challenged him. She said, no, I might not be in the club, but my faith gives me access to the club. And because I'm coming to you in faith, Jesus, you got to let me in. Jesus says, I've never seen so great a faith as this. Go, your daughter has been made. Now, if Jesus' mind can change. If Jesus can begin to check his own biases, if Jesus can acknowledge that my biases have drawn a line and put some people in and other people out, you mean to tell me we can? And if you read over in Matthew, he sends the disciples and he says, go out into all the nations. Jesus draws a wider, bigger circle. It's not just for, for some people. Now it's for all people because somebody said, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Jesus. Let me in. Let me in. And Jesus could not deny. So if Jesus' mind can change, if Jesus, what am I saying? I'll let you figure it out. If Jesus' mind can change, if Jesus' mind can be renewed, who are we? That our minds can't change. Uncomfortable. We get ready to get real uncomfortable. I want to take you to Mount Sinai. Y'all know that story. God has raised up Moses to take the children of Israel to the promised land. They're walking. Moses goes up to the mountain to be with God to get further instructions. While Moses is up on the mountain getting further instructions, him and God are up there, up there playing chess. God says, Moses, do you hear something? Moses says, God, Pay attention to the game. He says, Moses, no, I'm serious. Do you hear something? Moses like, no, just God, just pay, pay attention to what we're doing up here. So finally, God says, Moses, go check on your congregation. Moses goes down the mountain. When he gets down the mountain, they have built a golden castle. And they party in. And they're like, this is the cat that brought us out. This is the cat that brought us out. We're so glad we got it. God, we can see in touch. God hears it. And she's coming down the mountain. And I'm telling you, she is hot. Wide step she takes. You can hear her like thunder coming. And Moses is like, oh. She's like, Moses, I've had it up to here with him. I brought them out of Egypt, they complained. I fed them manna, they complained. I gave them water out of rock, they complained. I opened the Red Sea, and they said, he's like, tonight we will be having barbecue Hebrew. <laughs> Moses, as pastor, throws his hands up in front of God and the come and said, and says, God, please, you cannot, you cannot do this thing. What will people think? Remember God. Remember God. You are, you are merciful God. Remember you are compassionate God. Remember God. You are, you, are, you are quick to forgive. Don't do this thing. And God Almighty, anger was cooled into compassion because of the prayer of a pastor. She says, fine, you deal with it, Moses. We're going back on the mountain. 
If God Almighty can change God's own mind, what are you holding on to? If God Almighty, who's given reason to be to 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 be to be angry and pronounce judgment, if God Almighty can find compassion, if Jesus can find can check Jesus' own bias, if who are we then to say, well, this is the way I see the world and I'm never gonna change? I don't know why we're studying these books on racism. I don't know why we're talking about God and gay Christians. If God's mind can change. And Jesus can check Jesus' own bias. Ought not the church be engaged in the same kind? Ought we not be looking at our biases? Ought we not be checking ourselves to make sure that our anger is, has been cooled to compassion for those who have wronged us or hurt us? by the renewing of your mind so that you might know what God created you for. Moses interceded on behalf of how did God describe them as a stiff-necked people. A people unwilling to change. I'm not, I'm not going to I'm not going to take that study. I'm not going to a people unwilling God says, Moses, you deal with them. And do you know how long it took them to enter into the promised land? Forty years. Forty years they roamed around a mountain in a circle when the promised land was just right down the street. A whole generation had to die off in order for them to change their mind. Moses was like, promised land, this way. Uh, I don't know, I'm not really sure we should follow Moses or not. I think Moses might not even need to do it. Moses was like, promised land, this way. Well, should we do it Moses? I don't know, I'm kind of confused. Maybe Moses doesn't know what he's doing. Maybe we should promise land, this way. And for 40 years, they walked around the circle while Moses said, promised land, this way. God raised them up a leader to lead them in the promised land, and they could not let their mind change about what it was like to be in Egypt. is in the transforming business. Every day, our hearts must be renewed by the light of God's love. God is not trying to change you, to hurt you. God is trying to transform you so that we can be about God's business. So that we can be about God's business. You saw the TV. You watched it. Have we hit rock bottom? I don't know. But here's what I do know. Even at rock bottom, our minds can change. Even at rock bottom, we can find the light and follow the light. Even at rock bottom, we can find our way. I'm not here to condone or condemn. I'm here to own. As a clergy, we own this. As a pastor of this church, I own it. When we focus so much on trying to figure out who's right, and not trying to understand what it means to be a disciple. You cannot take the moral ground and not love your neighbor. We forgot to teach that. As a clergy person, I apologize. I'm sorry that we fed you all a gospel of a vengeful God and not a gospel of a God who is cool, whose anger can be cool to compare. As clergy, we must repent to the body of Christ. We 
we talked about Daniel and the lion's den, and Zacchaeus was a wee little man, but we didn't make it applicable to our everyday lives. And so we learned Bible stories, but we never became disciples. I'm sorry. I promise you, I'm going to do better. I promise you that there's a whole generation of clergy that are being raised up, that we are going to do better, but we failed. We were so worried about losing our jobs and losing our pension that we didn't teach the truth. The truth is, if you don't love your neighbor, everything else doesn't matter. The truth is, if you can't check your bias and be accepting of all, black and white, gay and straight, rich and poor, your religion means nothing. The truth is, if your church can't say black lives matter, you can't say that. If we can't own that, 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 that Christianity gave cover for racism, and homophobia and Islamophobia, if we can't own that, it's not the gospel. The corpus of the gospel is love your neighbor. No exceptions. We failed. I do not condone, I do not condemn, but I own on behalf of being called. My promise to you is that I will do a better job. There might be some Sundays when I stand up here and I have to speak the truth and you might be angered. I'll send you to the PRC. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to know my job is not to tell you what to do. My job is to make sure you have the tools to be able to discern the truth. That your mind might be renewed. That we might find our purpose. Is this rock bottom? I don't know. But if it is, God is there. Wait for us. People say, well, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna tell your what are you gonna tell your congregation? What are you gonna tell them? I'm gonna tell them we failed this clerk. Then I'm gonna make a promise to do better. Then I'm going to encourage them to turn it off. Take a break. Read the word and pray. And we're going to find our way back together. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
This morning, I'm going to tell you a story about Fred Craddock for our stewardship moment. A seminary professor was vacationing with his wife in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. One morning, they were eating breakfast at a little restaurant. A man came to their table, asked to sit down, and began speaking. See that mountain over there, pointing out the restaurant window? Not far from that base of that mountain, there was a boy born to an unwed mother. He had a hard time growing up because every place he went, he was always asked the same question. Hey boy, who's your dad? Whether he was at school, in the grocery store, or drugstore, people would ask the same question. Who's your dad? He would hide at recess and lunchtime from other students. He would avoid going into stores because that question hurt him so bad. When he was about 12 years old, a new preacher came to his church. He would always go in late and slip out early to avoid hearing the question, who's your daddy? But one day, the new preacher said the benediction so fast, he got caught and had to walk out with the crowd. Just about the time he got to the back door, the new preacher, not knowing anything about him, put his hand on his shoulder and asked him, son, who's your daddy? The whole church got deathly quiet. He could feel every eye in the church looking at him. Now everyone would finally know the answer to the question, who's your daddy? This new preacher, though, sensed the situation around him and using discernment that only the Holy Spirit could give, said to the following boy, wait a minute, I know who you are. I see the family resemblance now. You are a child of God. With that, he patted the boy on his shoulder and said, Boy, you've got a great inheritance. Go and claim it. With that, the boy smiled for the first time in a long time and walked out the door a changed person. Whenever anybody asked, Who's your daddy? He'd tell them, I'm a child of God. The distinguished gentleman got up from the table and said, isn't that a great story? The professor responded that it really was a great story. As the man turned to leave, he said, you know, if that new preacher hadn't told me that I was one of God's children, I probably never would have amounted to anything. And he walked away. The seminary professor and his wife were stunned he called the waitress over and asked her, do you know who that man was who just left that was sitting at our table? The waitress grinned and said, of course, everybody here knows him. That's Ben Hooper. He's the former governor of Tennessee. <laughs> um, if you want to give monetarily, we have three ways of giving at Parkway. You can simply mail a check to the church office. You can do an automatic withdrawal from your bank, or you could use a credit or debit card. And if you need instructions on that, just um, go to the church website. Please join me in prayer. Thank you, God of love, for the generosity you have given us. May our offering of gifts represent our spirit of joyous giving among us today and each day ahead. Amen. Ciao, Chris.
So we're doing um, communion a little bit differently. So if you didn't get one of those little, these little purple cups in the back, there's some on the table. We, we should have plenty. Um, if you take the clear one off first, and then the purple one, they they do it for me because I have a, the hard, the purple is hard to open, so I always have to have help. And if you hold it away from your body, you don't have to worry about it spilling sort of on you. The purple is a little bit more harder to open than than the clear one. If you need help, just let me know. We've got several people here. We have several. I know where you order plenty. I wait till our, till I hear the crackling stop, and we'll take it. We'll take it together. If you need any help? Need some help? Do you help? Everybody good? All right. On the night of his betrayal and arrest, as he shared a meal with his friends, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke it and shed, share, and said, share the bread. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, said, share, this is the cup of the new covenant. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Now let us take the bread together. Now let's take the wine together. those that are watching if you do not have a church home if you're looking for a place of inclusive love a place where we focus on discipleship and the and the call to do justice work in the world we want to invite you to come and be a part of, of our uh, body there will be more information you can find us on Facebook you can also find us on the web page uh, we would love to have you join us either in person or online we have two services, one at 8 and one at 10.30. Uh, you can call in to sign up for either one of those services, but, this, uh, uh, but we also make our worship services available online. Um, I don't think there are any more announcements. Just a reminder that our church-wide study starts Thursday. Um, please stand to receive this benediction. You go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose in your being there. God is constantly luring you and pulling you into God's own goodness and mercy. There is something that God wants to do through you, where you are. Believe this. Go. Allow your mind to be renewed and transformed in the love of Christ. Amen. Please follow your diaconist out.
Thank you.